welcome to the Talk Jiu-Jitsu podcast host, Uki Mike, Joy Bresky, and me, Jordan Pressinger from Jordan Teacher Jiu-Jitsu. All right, guys, welcome to the Talk Jiu-Jitsu podcast episode four. Today, we have Justin Bruckman on the show. Normally, it's uh, Joey, and but Justin's our first guest, and we're super excited to have him here today. So, um, I'm your first guest? Yeah, you're our first, first guest. Ever. Yeah, exactly. No, no shit. I was, I was about to shit, shit on you and say you've had four episodes and not had me on yet, but it's okay. You fucking <laughs> redeem yourself. So. Yeah, exactly. The the first spot goes to you, so it's extra special. Oh, thanks, man. You know, but Thank we're you. also we're like extra nervous because no, normally we just do this with Joey, and it's yeah. like, uh, you know, we've been doing this with Joey for like months and months, so it's just like super, yeah. uh, you know. But doing with someone else is going to be uh, a little different, but in a good way. So we're excited for it. Yeah, uh, I. I had my own podcast for quite a long time. Man, it's the best. Like, and the best ones are where you just sit and talk to, and have it with your friends and, and just kind of let it go wherever it goes, man. That's the best part. Like, I've done a thousand interviews in my life and they're the worst. You yeah. know what I mean? Because people ask you generic questions. It's always better. That's the point of the podcast is just have a conversation. Just sit and hang out with your buds or, or learn new stuff, right? So, uh, yeah, fire away, man. Let's do it. Whatever you want. Yeah, for sure. So um, first, just a bit of an introduction about Justin. Justin is a pioneer in Canadian MMA. He's, uh, you know, fought the best of the best of the Canadian MMA fighters, been doing jiu-jitsu for a long time. And you're also a judo black belt as well. Am I correct about that? Yeah, you are. I started judo first. Yeah, so like Justin's been uh, training since... Uh, first of all, we'll just, we'll just get you to answer this. So how long have you been training for and how did you get started in mm-hmm. martial arts? And uh, yeah, let, let us know. Yeah, I... Uh... My, my my martial arts journey is uh is crazy i'm really fortunate i'm like you we're we are professional martial artists and it, it, like uh, one capacity or another whether you're competing or running your gym or all your other things you're doing now like that's what we do we make our, our money off martial arts and and uh i started my journey i guess you would call it on uh march 2nd 97 like i know the day wow. because uh, it was uh i told this story a thousand times and uh, but I think it's an important one. Like I uh, was 22 years old and I was uh, on a dead end path. And uh, what had happened is uh, I was out drinking one night and I got in a fight at the bar and I woke up the next morning because it was like a Monday or a Tuesday or something stupid and uh, I hung over and I missed my ride to work. So I was wandering around town in Whitby in the slush in the rain. And I just happened to walk like sulking basically. And I walked by this gym and I wandered in the door and uh, t- was talking to the owner sort of thing. I'm like, man, I gotta, I'm gonna fucking die. I gotta do something with my life. Like I'm turning into an alcoholic. I'm just, my life's just shit. And uh, I said, I, I just need to get in shape and exercise. And I said, I don't have any money. I'm like, I'll, I'll mop your, I'll sweep your floors. I'll clean the gym. I'll do whatever. And he's like, why don't you, uh, sounds like you should try some judo. And there was a, he's like, we had a class in about a half an hour. So he threw me a gi, put me on the mats. And then I, uh, I did a judo class. I was like, holy shit. I came back and did another one that night. And then I, uh, went and quit my job the next day and, uh, wow. never, and now, uh, I've, and I've never done anything ever again, except for like travel, teach, train, whatever. This job I have right now is like literally like the second job I've ever had. So. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So like, I, I felt like I have a pretty similar experience. I started when I was 21 and as soon as I did it, like I knew that this is what I wanted to do like for the rest of my yeah. life. I want to start a gym, even as a white belt, I knew I want to start a gym. And uh, it's pretty amazing just to have that, um, you know, insight so quickly and, and fall in love so quickly with it. And w- so you started, it was a judo gym that you started with. And then eventually yeah. you, you moved on to Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and striking and all that too. Yeah. Uh, I did a, I dove right into judo. Uh, I just found it. I, I'm, judo comes naturally to me. I have my jiu-jitsu, things like that. I have to like work really hard at and kickboxing and stuff. But judo, like even to this day, out of shape, I can just do judo, but that's because everyone, all jujitsu guys suck at judo too, right? Yeah, so it makes you look good. True. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I just took to it naturally. And it said, same as you, like, I, I knew, I'm like, I don't know how, but I'm doing, I'm doing this. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And it was, for me, it was a pretty easy decision because I had nothing anyway. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like I was giving up anything to go and, you know, pursue this dream. I literally had fucking nothing but the clothes on my back anyway. So it really had nothing to lose. And I just went all in on it. And then uh, I trained judo for a, a couple.
couple of years and I competed in judo like the first week I practiced. So I had three practices and they put me in a tournament and that was wow. the beginning of my competitive career. Wow. That's bold. And, uh, how'd, it, how'd it go for it? You? Oh, uh, bittersweet. Like I won my first tournament and, but that's actually the, the same day that I injured my neck for the first time. Mm. So, which is why I retired in the first place. So my, the lifelong in injuries that I had, uh, that I have now and I deal with now are actually from the, the very first week I started training ever. I've never had, uh, I've never, I've never known what it's like to train without, uh, herniated discs or anything else. Like, so I've had that injuries from day one, but I went through, uh, I went through the judo scene, like provincial judo scene, like really fast. And I was in 11, uh, in 11 months, I became a brown belt which is pretty, pretty That's quick. Fast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, but, and it was, it's, uh, basically it was like, I came up a little bit differently than everyone else. Cause I was just, I'd find a tournament somewhere every weekend. Like there's thousands of tournaments in judo. And, uh, so I came up through, it's called, uh, I believe it's called Batsugan. And that's like competitive, like I was just beating everyone. So they had to continue to put belts on me. So I probably did my first year of, judo competition i probably did 150 matches or something crazy like that i just ripped through that and then uh then the way judo works uh is once you're a brown belt you have to sit for a year uh before you can apply for your black belt it's a way different system than, than jiu-jitsu is right you have to collect points and competitive points and and time and rank points and then you go in front of a provincial grading board and stuff like that so what had happened is um, I got to brown belt and I think I, uh, and, and then it was, yeah, I wait, sat around for a year and I waited for grading and grading for judo at back then. I'm not sure now, but uh, grading was four days long. Wow. And so, and two days is like uh, you're doing your technique kind of thing. Like you're showing, you know, all your, you, the syllabus, like the, your all your throws and all your ground techniques, it's all the same stuff as we do now for jiu-jitsu really it's just a little more, more formal and then the second two days is you do your forms your cat does and stuff like that right which i never i only learned for that like i never practiced this some people do it just for the art form and they like that stuff i'm like i just want to fight yeah. and what what had happened is uh you back then i think you needed like 110 points to get uh your black belt right so the way it works is when you compete uh you get points based on how you win your like competition and then uh and then points for each rank that you beat so like if i throw uh throw a brown belt for a pawn you get i don't know like 20 points if you throw a black belt for a pawn you get like 30 points or whatever and it all stacks up over the over your years and um and that's how you accumulate your points and then you apply and then you go through your grading but what happened i already had my points to the grading and I went to, uh, I did the first two days and then it was the Ontario Open, which was a big judo tournament that, at that point was in, was the next weekend. I went into that tournament and there was, uh, my bracket was a pretty massive bracket. All the Quebec athletes and stuff were here. And I ended up with, uh, I can't remember. It was like two or three Olympians in my weight class. And, uh. And I was just a brown belt. So they, the way it unfolded, they just underestimated me. Walked out and they're like, oh, how are we going to slap this little bitch around? And it was pretty cool because everyone in the whole arena stopped because they wanted to watch the Olympians compete. And then they ran into me. And then and I slammed uh, two guys that were on the Olympic team. I, I fucking dropped them on their heads. And uh, so I think I won four matches that day. And I ended up with, uh, and then I, I actually lost in the finals to uh, the national champ, the junior national champ. So I, I beat all these guys and then I get my ass handed to me by 17 year old at the end. But oh, man. Uh, yeah, the way yeah, she goes sometimes. He he went to the Olympics too, so I'm okay. Yeah. But, but so the next, I went back to the second half of the grading and uh, they're like, Mr. and there's like a couple hundred people there and all the gr big grading board, like, and then Mr. Bruckman stepped forward. I'm like, fuck, here we go. Like, what did I do wrong? Because no one liked my sensei either. Like he was kind of, like not everyone's favorite so i'm like all oh, right ever and uh they they're like uh they gave some sort of speech and i'm like holy shit i think they're complimenting me and they're like go sit down mr bruckman you're done for the weekend i was what the fuck so i 
I skipped out on the second half of my grading because I had uh, cleaned out the entire country in one tournament and you needed 100, 110 points for your uh for your belt and i think i had 360 or something like that so they just basically sat me down and said you're done you're good to go and and that made me as far as i know i'm the fastest in canada to ever receive a black belt in in judo wow, wow. that's uh, amazing and in the so to go back to your original question in that process how i started jiu-jitsu was i kind of want i always knew i wanted to do mma i didn't know there was a way to do it but i knew that jiu-jitsu was the next step so i met uh monkey and uh shaw franco and all my teammates like in the process of doing judo i started cross training in jiu-jitsu as well and that's how i met them and like actually master silvio he wouldn't give me my blue belt in jiu-jitsu until i finished he's like once you get your black belt in judo then he's like, then I'll, then we'll talk about your blue belt. Cause he's, he wanted to make sure that I finished what I started with judo. And I'm really glad that I did. Cause it, to me now my judo black belt means like just as much to me as my jujitsu black belt does. Right. So, but he was, uh, he was completely, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still thank him for that because I probably, if he would have handed me my blue belt, I just started would have chasing more competitions and not chase belts. But if I started going down that road, I probably would never would have bothered going back to get my black belt. So I'm happy it worked out in that way. So a blue belt and a black belt at the same time. And then, uh, and then uh, started, like I met up with Shaw and those guys, Monkey and Marco, because I wanted to do MMA. So I traveled to Toronto every day and then like and do kick, kickboxing with Shaw, stuff like that. And then within, uh, within a year of meeting those guys, I was in, I was in the, on pay-per-view fighting for, uh tko or ucc like at all and all that happened in like three years it was crazy wow. so you went from starting judo to fighting professional mma within three years yeah and that's yeah. incredible and getting a black belt in there somewhere too yeah, yeah. and getting yeah. a black belt in judo blue belt in jiu-jitsu yeah. that's pretty impressive yeah. and what year was this it was like 2000 or so uh, i guess i i think i started i start i know i started in 97 i think my first pro fight was uh it would have been the end of 99 or early 2000 or something like that. Yeah. I can't remember the exact dates. I'm, I'm not sure, but something like that. It'll hop. It happened really, really fast. It was crazy. What was it? And what was it like back then, you know, training for MMA, I imagine much different than it is now. Like now there's huge. Oh games. yeah. Yeah, you, like you guys, yeah. I imagine kind of like grassroots, kind of had to figure it out yourselves because you guys were the first real Ontario uh, MMA fighters, I yeah, ever really. And and it was it illegal yeah. back then? Correct. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, the only places you could compete then was uh, like you know on the kind of reserves and stuff like that. And I was actually my first pro fight was the first sanctioned uh event ever in canada was wow. in montreal yeah they, they were they were the first time they had a proper commission like and everything in place completely different than what it is now we were in a ring there was only three weight classes but that was like the start the grassroots of it all and training back then was yeah it was still very very uh style versus style right uh we we bridged the we all start training and then um i get because there was a I would say overall, I'm like second generation MMA, like almost first, but more like so. The first generation is re, as everyone remembers is Hoist, right? And uh, and that was Jiu Jitsu versus every, everything, and and like style for kickboxing versus wrestling. And then after then we start to kind of figure out no, you have to cross train, right? So we were the first generation to really really cross train, and we but yeah, we were figuring it all out. And where we were very fortunate it was. Um, our training room had all the fighters who were actually really good in dis different disciplines. We had Sean Pearson, uh, who is a stud, like world class wrestler, and then we had uh, Shaw, who's a world class, like, uh, world class, like real legit badass bare knuckle karate guy, uh, like last of a dying breed, like real karate. And then, uh, and then we had a guy like Marco Costa, who has a brilliant mind for jiu jitsu, and Monkey, who's just fucking awesome at everything. And then we all kind of, we were all in a way, we were all kind of each other's coaches, right? So uh, we still, still made, and we had some good boxers and we just kind of made it all kind of work. And then to my, the success I have 
with my athletes and stuff today is based on like what we learned in those early days in those rooms by making mistakes ourselves. You know what I mean? Cause we didn't have access to all these everywhere you go, man. Like, look, your gym's got jujitsu, gi, no gi, kickbox and this, that like, you can go to any, any gym now, any reputable gym and they have, you know, good coaches in each area. Right. Uh, now making, blending it all together and making it MMA is a different thing, but there's so many resources available that we had, VHS tapes, you know what I mean? We were just making yeah. it all up. So it was crazy. Yeah. What, what were some of those mistakes you guys made? I imagine like, uh, sparring too hard might be one of them. Like, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, on literally every mistake in the book, like, yeah. uh, stuff to me, that's just common sense now is like, but it's great. Cause I, 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 I go and tell my guys, I'm like, I don't know. I don't always know what's going to work, but I can fucking tell you what's not because we did it right. So yeah, hard sparring, uh, overtraining, uh, the, the things that I know about, uh, strength and conditioning and nutrition and, uh, periodization and like everything now is just, it's insane to compare what it was because we were, we were the test tube babies. You know what I mean? We were the ones like, making it like we were in the experiment right so yeah uh heart i think uh I'll, i think my generation right now we're all paying really paying for hard sparring uh I, I would say the biggest and most important thing that i learned and i try to really uh stress my guys now and everyone in general is uh is your health like injuries uh prevention and uh rehab and because like I mentioned earlier, I hurt my neck day, like almost day one. And now I got to live with that forever because my generation was like, you got man up, tough it out, do this. And like, okay, but like the whole time I'm out there with a broken neck and just, you know, I didn't know any better. So I, someone gets a slightest boo-boo. I'm like, okay, well, let's educate, educate ourselves on that injury. Let's find out what's going on because maybe it's nothing, but maybe it's something begins, becomes nagging and then chronic. And now the next thing you know, you're, hooked on pills or whatever like you know what i mean like it's there's injuries out there that can change your life forever and they happen to you as a young person you we still got 50 60 years left on this planet man it's no way to live so i i think uh yeah being being uh much more proactive with uh injury the injury prevention stuff and uh and educating yourself on things like injury and uh and rehabilitation and proper nutrition and proper weight cutting we didn't know how to cut weight you know all these things we did literally did everything i can't i can't even think of anything we actually did right except just being tough you know what I mean? like yeah we made every mistake you could if you could dream it up i, I could probably tell you yeah we did that it was pretty dumb so. how, how do you find the gym atmosphere then compared to now um the gym culture I've, I, I've been around for long enough to watch it go kind of through waves and i'm sure you guys have too where uh my first team are my like my family members like my brothers and i did which is something i don't say brothers or something i don't say lightly like uh there was a camaraderie in that room that i never had any any time ever in my life and um like because i didn't my family life was and things like that went like i had a unusual childhood and in, in adolescence and uh i was always searching for something and when i found these guys and i'm like that's where i knew that i belonged that's where i felt really actually like properly loved for the first time in my life and that's something that i've seen uh come and go i'm sure a lot of people have those groups and families in every single gym that they had that as well right but i think with a lot of these um big i don't want to call them big box gyms but they are in a way like a lot of that can kind of go away because there's so much about it is about making money now which is important but or it's just like it's so competitive that people are missing the point of it all like it's to make i don't know i'm hard to explain but like, there's a million ways, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's changed over the years. And, uh, you know, one is it's turned into an industry. You know what I mean? You, uh, you live it, you understand, like you, uh, you got to, you have to find a balance of like having a gym that creates a good product, like proper, 
like real jiu-jitsu and real kickboxing, but still market it to everyone and then still make competitors. So you're not a McDo, you don't want to be a McDojo either. Right. So I think the business side of things is the one thing that's really changed the culture of the entire thing. Um, and, uh, and, and the level that the level of competition I, you see has changed things a lot too. You see a lot of guys jumping from team to team now that you didn't used to. Right. Yeah. When we, when we were fighting and i'm not saying that's wrong but when we were competing and we were fighting whatever i was like your team was your tribe your family your those are the people you went to war with and like good or bad win or lose we stuck together and now the way that it's kind of go gone now is people are going to uh yeah they're just they're like on going over here it's better gyms it's better training right and you can't fault them because uh these people who are going down that path they're they're playing a sport. They're not, um, they're not, they're not, they're not treating it like a martial arts or a culture or a way of life. It's they're treating it like a sport. So of course you need to, if you're going to treat it like a sport, you need to go treat it like uh, a sport and find the best available training, coaching partners, uh, facility. Like that's just how the way, but if you treat it like a sport, man, uh, it'll break your heart at some point. Do you think right? the culture, we, sorry, do you think the culture has changed in jiu-jitsu because it was more rooted in the MMA in the past and now it's more like sport, more like recreational? Oh my God. Well, 100%, 100%. And I think the way that I, the best I can describe that is like, I love jiu-jitsu, every single aspect of it. I love jiu-jitsu for MMA. I love jiu-jitsu for self-defense. I love sport jiu-jitsu. I love modern jiu-jitsu. I love old school jiu-jitsu. I love gi, no gi. I love it all. Uh, I personally learned jiu-jitsu to fight for MMA. That was the purpose of me studying it and training it. Now it's be turned into something completely different where people are, they're, they're training jiu-jitsu for jiu-jitsu because that's the game and that's the sport now. So there's definitely, uh, that's what's changed a lot too. It's like people are just doing jiu-jitsu as a hobby or a recreation or, like, or a sport, whatever else. Or we, my generation, like we all learn it because we want to fight someone. It's completely, completely different, right? Um, that That's that's what frustrates me a little bit about jiu-jitsu sometimes. Still, the, still one of the hardest sports out there. To, but like, don't ever tell me that it's a fight because it's not. You've been in a fight. You know the difference. Yeah. yeah. How often are Huge you, difference. how often... Yeah, how often are you scared going into a jiu-jitsu match? Right? Uh, yeah, not scared. Only scared to lose. But going into a fight is yeah, very different. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, man, it's different, right? There's there's consequences to MMA, exactly. right? Jiu-jitsu, your ego gets hurt and you go home. You know right. what I mean? Like it's uh, so that there, there's a big shift in that. Uh, it really drives part of that. The thing that drives you crazy in there is there's people like, uh, well, it's technique over everything. Right. You know what I mean? Like jujitsu will beat this and jujitsu will be that like jujitsu only beats people who don't know jujitsu. You know what I mean? It doesn't people, it doesn't beat guys who do when it comes down to jujitsu versus jujitsu. It's the guy that puts the time into the mats, right? Where who, yeah. Athleticism, strength, uh, gas tank, like all these things, right? Cause that's, but it's still preaching a lot of ways. Like, well, good technique and leverage and timing and this and that, you know what I mean? Like, that's not, but it's not, it's not actually true. Otherwise we wouldn't have weight classes or belt divisions or genders or the, you know what I mean? Like people that train jujitsu thinking that jujitsu can, can overcome everything have never been in a real fight before. And that's part of the culture that drives me crazy. Cause I'm watching these meatheads now, uh, there's one or like winning matches, pounding their chest, like you know what I mean? And just being douchebags. I'm like, dude, you've never been punched in the face and you're like, calm down. You just want a wrestling match. Not even a real wrestling match because compared to wrestling, jiu-jitsu is pretty fucking easy and we all know I it. I agree. So, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that that's changed a lot too. I that It's really strange the way that it's come. When we all started, it was tribe gang versus gang and everyone was like but now i'm seeing it in a way come back around again where this generation doesn't know that they're really not that badass like they're and they're like i humble my guys constantly when my guys go to a tournament or a fight or whatever else they're polite they wander around shake everyone's hand hello to the coaches how i'm just a student he says a lot of nice things about you right now i'm like i'll go to i don't go to jiu-jitsu 
jiu-jitsu tournaments anymore because they'll see some fucking douche hipster wearing spats with a shitty beard like me me mugging me i'm like what the fuck is this man do you like and i would never be like do you know who i am you know what I mean? Because that's like a that's even douchier thing to do. But I'm like, before you look at me sideways, you should maybe go ask your coach who I am. Exactly. And he'll tell you that I'll fucking mop the floor with you and all your little tips, your fucking friends, right? So yeah. I don't know. Like that part has changed. There, there's this, there's this weird, I'm better than you, douchebag element that has slid into it somewhere in the last few years, and I think it's really shitty. Yeah. But, those, no, I agree. P- anyone at any walk of life, they they get they they get what's coming to them at some point anyway, right? So, hundred percent. I think it's a lot of like lower belts. They like uh, they they think because they do jujitsu, they're like a warrior and like uh, you know like they they're waiting yeah. for yeah, someone to fight them and stuff so they can show off how you know how great of a fighter they are. But in reality, a lot of them can't even do takedowns. Don't know any don't know any punches. So yeah. they only do jujitsu. So yeah, they yeah. they get humble uh, pretty yeah. quickly. And getting punched yeah, in the face is quite. Me, Go ahead. Sorry. Oh my God. Change it. Yeah. I was going to say punches, uh, getting punched and everything. Face. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what's yeah. that quote again? It's, it's like, a, uh, every time you get hit, you like go down a belt level because it's true. Oh, like, at, it changes everything for sure. Yeah, for sure. I've seen it. I've seen it a million times, man. And it really doesn't matter. Like as soon as someone's violent and you don't know how to control them, they're going to eat your lunch, man. And they got that. Like you have MMA guys that, go into jiu-jitsu and clean the place out and they've never put a gi on on their lives right so don't you don't say don't tell me jiu-jitsu over everything you know what i mean like if, if, if uh i don't know i just it really bothers me but but again the, the the benefits are so incredible like it doesn't even compare i'm just a snob you know what i mean in a way so like but because there is a lot of things that have gone kind of weird that i don't really like but yeah these uh, a big part of the problem is um yeah, the, the rule set and everything's changed the way, like, you don't even have to take, you can you can go all the way to the world at, at an elite level and never have to score takedown on anyone now. Like, that's crazy to me, right? If you don't, the essence of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was self-defense. You should know how to, first off, you should know how to run away. That's what Jiu-Jitsu is designed for, is if someone grabs you, you can run, you can break free and run away. Or if someone tackles you, you can run, you can get yourself to a position where you can run away. And if you can't run away, then I'll strangle the shit out of you, right? No other martial art will do that for you, right? Boxing, kickboxing, all these things are, well, wrestling, well, of course, but like all these things, they're, they're great if you're going to have, create an exchange. But the moment someone grabs you, where's your boxing or your kickboxing, whatever. Not that they're not all amazing and functional, like training all of them, but jiu-jitsu is the one that's going to create opportunity for you to get out, right? Yeah, and think- these guys can't, they don't know how to block a punch or smother a guy or take them down, right? All they know is uh, la- well, lapel stuff and worm guard and all this shit. I'm like, that's not going to save you. You know what I mean? It's uh, And but that's fine. You're playing a sport, but like, don't tell me otherwise. You know what I mean? That stuff stuff that drives me nuts. Yeah, I agree. I think that's where the differentiation is important, where it's like, it's fine if you do jiu-jitsu for a sport and you only take it that serious. But if you, you know, do it as like a sport recreationally and you consider yourself like a, a warrior and a fighter, it's probably best to reflect on that. You know, and I know like for me, like as a black belt, like I would never want to get into a fight now because there's so many variables and you know, it's just not worth the oh, risk yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. But like as a blue belt, I was one of those guys like, Oh, I can take on anyone, you know, just like so delusional. I feel like, um, as you kind of, uh, get up in the ranks, you almost you obviously become wiser and you also become a little more like cynical and like really understanding like, um, you know, the, the, the faults in jujitsu and, and how it could be improved in the culture and everything. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, I do my best to keep it, keep it real you know you know what i mean uh but at the same time we all got to eat too like uh i've never sold a belt in my life like that's just not however well i sell lessons if you capitalize on them and you earn belts and that's great but like if you're not a like now the the belt system is changed into not a level of knowledge it's changed into a level of competition and that's wrecking jujitsu right so i'm like you gotta you got a guy that's a brown belt that can't teach teach someone how to do a simple ogoshi you know what i mean or and or how to fall properly or a bullshit 1993 hoist hoist gracie double leg you know what i mean like like that's you're missing the point of the martial art how you ever it's 
you 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 might be able to share the sport, but you can't share the culture or the martial art if you're not sticking to what jujitsu is actually supposed to be, right? And it does. It's creating a false sense of security in all these people. Like, and yeah, like where you and I are very much like it, as because we've been at, been at this for a bit. Like, we see the holes and we admit them. And I I do I try to patch those things up the best we can, but because of Instagram, YouTube, this and that, people don't want to shrimp 10,000 times a day. They want to do flying arm bars and the latest technique that, you know what I mean? Like that people give you a 20 minute, 20 second clip of, you know what I mean? Even though they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And like, it's, yeah, there's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a totally different planet, man. What you get to planet now. So. Yeah. Back, back like in, you know, 2000, like what were the, like the, primary techniques like what was like the up and coming kind of stuff like kind of new to you and uh yeah, like what was popular back then compared to now um the fundamentals yeah right which are which are still what if you really watch stuff now it's still how people are winning and you with jiu-jitsu or ever made whatever else like we were learning a t- simple takedowns passing the guard like it's the point system as you know is modeled after a real fight take him down passes defense and then keep advancing your position until you get the finish. Knee on belly, mount, kick the back. That's all we were doing, right? And then you started kind of finding different ways to make that happen. You know what I mean? Different takedowns, different guard passes. But that's all it was. It was just the system. Because the system works in MMA. You take your guy down because you don't want to strike with him. You pass his guard. You pin him. We hit knee on belly. And then we land a couple strikes. And then we go to the mount. We secure it. And then we hit him and he turns his back. Like, that's how... It's supposed to work, right? So that's really the stuff that back then, because the resources were so limited too, that we didn't have all these. The, the internet was just barely a thing, you know what I mean? So it was we didn't have all these distractions and or all these uh, resources and things to learn from. So we the fundamentals were all we had. I think that's why my generation is still really good at them because, like, I can't do any of this modern shit, but I'll figure you out when I, you know, I'll pass your guard and do all this, like all things I was doing 20 years ago, because the fundamentals work no matter what the latest fad is. And they change every year at the worlds and whatever else, but it's always hip escape, pass the guard, like the basics, right? That's, yeah, I think that's really what it was back then. It was just, that's all we had. So that's all we did. You know? Was there much emphasis on leg, leg locks? I know a lot has come out in the last, say, six, seven years. That's really become a huge part of jiu-jitsu. But back then, when you were starting, was that even on the table for you back then? Um, a little bit. Like t- There was some basic stuff, but like we, uh, yeah, very, very fun, to, like rudimentary stuff, like straight ankle locks, knee bar. And it was like you saw it somewhere in a magazine or whatever else. You're like, ooh, let's try that. There was no real way to know or we just experimented a lot with it, right? So it made it uh, – uh, we were – man, we were heel hooking white belts. That's who the term you were allowed to. Like there was no rules in tournaments. Like you just went out there to submit guys. There was no points yet, nothing, right? So we just smash uh, – now it's changed over the years where you don't do those attacks till you're a higher belt, which I still think is really important. You have to learn them, but you can't have white belts, blue belts, heel hooking each other. That's how bad shit happens. And then none of us are going to have a job, right? So there's not as much emphasis. And, uh, but again, I was learning, uh, at jujitsu for MMA, you know what I mean? So like, I didn't even really look at that stuff because if I'm going for your feet, that means I don't have control of your body. Right. Yeah. Right. But, so uh, I, uh, yeah, I always think of, of foot locks. The game's changed right now, but like I always look at foot at lower body submissions as an act of desperation. Right. Yeah. Now it's changed because guys are jumping to guard. Like the rules are changed or people are fighting from underneath and that's like their primary attacks. Right. But as soon as there's punches involved, like all that, a lot of that shit just goes out the window. Right. So there's no point. Well, it seems like back then, like back in like the early 2000s, like Japan had a big uh, leg lock emphasis, like all the Japanese fighters. Mm-hmm. I know Antonio Carvalho, who was a training partner of yours. Um, yeah, he, he fought in Japan a lot. Like, how did you prepare? How did he, or, I don't, did you fight in Japan too, Justin? Or Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. the Shudo? first one. At, yeah, I fought in Shudo. And then uh, I got scouted for Shudo uh, after I won in Vancouver. And then I went there and competed and then, Tony got signed with Shudo and he did a couple in the States and then they called him to fight in Japan as well. And uh, that's kind of like 
that's how our whole thing started with on that side of the planet. It was, uh, and then that's, a, we went there and that's how, eventually how we all got in the UFC was coming from Shudo and stuff like that too. Right. But, uh, yeah, they were, the Japanese were way ahead of us at that point in MMA history. Like we were all going, we wanted to fight there because the best lighter, there was no 155 or in the UFC until like almost the year I retired. Right. So there was like, we were the best 55ers, 45ers, everyone was in, in Japan. So, uh, and they had their submission game and their, like Shudo was already 20 years old or something like that. They've been around forever. So they were way, way ahead of us. And because I think maybe it's because they didn't weren't as wrestling strong that they mm-hmm. were, they did work a lot of lower body submissions, but like Ruman Asato, who is uh, Antonio fought him. He's like the leg lock. He was one of the leg lock masters. You know what I mean? Like he's from generation where uh, Imanari's from and all these other guys. Right. So they and they had the bet. They had, they also, they love their, um, they're pro wrestling that's yeah. what it is too yeah like they're big on their pro wrestling culture there and that's what it's game catch wrestling so that it kind of goes back and forth through the entertainment value for those people as well yeah it, sorry it makes sense because you know a lot of the japanese fighters didn't only do leg locks but they also did like flashy things like flying arm bars and just, yeah yeah they were kind of like almost like ahead of the yeah definitely ahead of the game in that sense of like what's kind of popular now so mm-hmm. yeah i find that really interesting yeah me too yeah yeah they uh very um uh, sports entertainment oriented. Like you would, uh, they appreciate it to this day. If you go to a Japanese event, it's quiet. You know what I mean? They still appreciate the technique. It's not, it's not that just bleed culture or that like, let's get wasted in the stands and like wear tap out shirts. It's like, they actually appreciate what they're watching. So it makes the, makes the sport a little, so you, like you even look at, you look at back at pride and things like that. You can take losses, right? Because you were, you weren't, you were fighting for the entertainment of the crowd. You're not necessarily fighting for the, of course you're fighting for the victory, but that it was to entertain the crowd while you were fighting. So you could, if you went out there and you lost two in a row, but or three in a row, but you're a fucking warrior and you put on a show and the people love you, you're going to come back because you're selling tickets. Now, the way it is now, I'm like, you got to, you can't get to the UFC until you have that like 10 and 0 or 10 and one or whatever else. And if you're in the UFC and you lose a couple, then you're gone. You know what I mean? Like it's, that's, it's a little bit different culture over here when it comes to that. So that allows you to take those bigger risks and do flashy shit. You know I mean? Because people, the crowd appreciates the effort. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the problem is what those big flashy explosive techniques, when they go wrong, is usually when something bad happens to you. Right. So exactly. So, so you said that you're, um, when you were coming up, it was more about self-defense. Do you find that the BJJ for self-defense now, have you seen a lot of that online? The newer stuff, it's some of it's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah. A lot of it's a lot of bullshit. 100%. Today, anyways. Uh, Yeah. Uh, I still, like, a lot of our warm-ups, some, like, simple stuff, self-defense things that I put in there. I I try to teach, what I teach, I'm like, this will work, gi, no gi, self-defense, MMA, like, uh, across the board kind of stuff. So, like, I add simple self-defense stuff in based uh, for, just for our warm-ups. Because no one, excuse me, no one ever wants to, like, drill self-defense or in practice self-defense is boring as shit, right? But I'll make you warm up with it so it's drilled into your head, you know what I mean? So if you ever do need it, and it is functional when I wrist lock everyone, I can't roll anymore, I'm broken. But if you touch me, I'll fold your wrist backwards. Like this, that's just self, it's self-defense, right? Some people call it prison rules, I call it self-defense. But that's, um, it's like anything else. As soon as it's marketable and or if people monetize it, you're gonna find poor, versions of it everywhere because people are trying to cash in you know what i mean yeah there is horrible self-defense out there just like there's horrible fucking like diets and horrible recipes and horrible this coach and that coach like there's always going to be what's real and then someone sees how it works and they're like i can get paid to do that and they'll do their own version and it usually sucks right yeah, yeah there's some bad shit out there that'll get you killed I think I think the best self like jujitsu self defense is fundamentals anyways like, like you know hitting doubles or hip throw whatever it is you know going yeah. to mount controlling the person 
So I think like fundamentals are, you know, not only super important for the sport itself, but yeah, self-defense. And I'm doing this like Hodger Gracie study for YouTube, making a YouTube video on Hodger Gracie. Mm -hmm. And um, I, one thing I found really interesting because people always said he's all about fundamentals and I was watching it and it's like, wow, it's, it's true. He's just like, he does all the stuff that you just learn in like a basics class, but he just does it super well. And I think sometimes people will kind yeah. of gravitate, sort of gravitate to, away from that and want to learn more crazy of stuff. But like, you know, myself as well, like, um, I think people in the past, like, um, made of like when I was a blue belt, purple belt, might've considered me more like sports, just like flashy or whatever. But like, as I get, um, you know, more and more like experience, I just, I'm just do fundamentals. That's it. That's it. So like, um, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think people kind of really get that through their head. Like fundamentals are the most important thing. It's not just our, the, our, the black belts that are cynical like saying that. It's true. You know, it is. It, advanced techniques are the basics mastered. Like I'm going to smash you with the same scissor sweep that I learned my first week of jiu-jitsu ever. Uh, you know what I mean? And probably the same guard pass and probably the same mount. and pre Like literally, it, I'm just really, really good at and efficient at those basic basic things right like because we've done it for generations and we understand how to do it on every single body type and whatever else but yeah like they they have this highest success rate so why would you stray away from them and as you get older you know like i'm not doing that i'm not folding myself backwards i'm yeah. not gonna i don't want to i don't want to get hurt i just want this over with you know what i mean so like yeah. you do stick to those basics a lot more because they are they are the safest way to go about doing things too right and so it's, I love the creative side. I love trying new things and messing around with the gi and, you know, but like, as you get older, you stick to the basics because you're just less risk of injury and stuff too. Right. So. Exactly. What, what were some of the techniques you kind of have seen as like fads in jujitsu or kind of took over? I know like the Baron Bola, for example, it was like all the rage yeah. in like 20, uh, like 2015 or so. And, you know, I know like deep half was popular before that in 50, 50, like, cause I started yeah. in 2012. So, you know, I don't know what was kind of happening before that. Like what's your experience with, with that? Uh, j and just before the 50, 50 was like the Eddie Bravo phase with the rubber guard and yeah. like every, and it's whatever. Yeah. It's uh, now it's now it's all leg attacks and uh and then um there was like a few years ago there was like hit the takedown just hang out with the guy's guard you know we yeah. score the points win like no i think you should be advancing position and looking for finishes at all times but like you got to play the rules uh now yeah now um the first real big fad i can think of uh outside of like yeah, the first first real one that was like, oh, here we go, uh, was was definitely the rubber guard thing, and that was, uh, and it didn't, it really didn't last that long because it's not it's not for people that, it's for people who are fairly flexible and whatever else, and it's just like, straight up, it's just bad jujitsu, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> if I can if I can touch your face, your jujitsu is just not that good, right? So. A lot of the stuff that they're showing and doing them like that is not functional. It might be, it might, that stuff might work for like one in a hundred people. You know what I mean? Like no one, get, people aren't supposed to be able to put their feet behind their head. You know what I mean? Like, and, and why are you on the bottom? You know what yeah. I mean? Like we're, these are all great things, but like, why were you on the bottom in the first place? Why do you need, why do you have a Google -go plot in your arsenal? You should have hit the takedown first. You should have been on top. That's how I break everything down. Like, well, how, how do I defend the back? I'm like, how do you get there? Right. So a lot of times we got to take it back a few steps, but uh, yeah, the rubber guard, I think was um, the first real big fad I could remember. Uh, and then, yeah, like you said, after that, a couple of years after that, it's a 50, 50, then bear bolo and uh, the De La Hiva. Uh, but I, uh, De La Hiva actually was probably before the rubber guard thing, but the De La Hiva is, I still think is very functional. Yeah. You know what I mean, like, it, there are some versions of where I'm like, well, I'm not trying that, but it's actually like, you know, De La Hiva is a genius. You know what I mean? I think, um, I think there's still tons and tons of stuff that, even from a self defense perspective, like that, that a lot of De La Hiva stuff like works very well. So that I know that was a big fad, and I also think it's part of the genius that we, you should learn, right, yeah. on top of your fundamentals. So I think it's really important.
Well, because realistically, you know, if someone is like standing, they're not on their knees, you need to get some mm -hmm. sort of guard. And a lot of times, yeah. you know, it's gonna be difficult to get a half guard or close guard. And you're kind of forced towards like De La Hiva or reverse De La Hiva. So those are definitely necessity. But then you start getting to things like, um, you know, like worm guard and like even I, I like lasso, but lasso is definitely like a more sport type of guard. And uh, yeah. yeah, there's just some of these positions that um, you yeah, have just kind of like, I don't know, I guess kind of like uh, taken away from fundamentals and people really like focus on them so much and really try to figure out like every minute like detail and all, all sorts of crazy stuff to it. So, um, yeah, I, it's like it's yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going with this. <laughs> no, no, I understand what you're saying. Like the beauty of Jiu Jitsu is that it's progressive. It, it is constantly evolving and always changing. Right. But I think what people need to focus on is not the next fad. It need, you need to focus on what's the next thing that works. You know what I mean? Like that, cause jujitsu is notorious. You're like, oh, uh, that's a double leg with this and that. I'm like, that's jujitsu now. They're like, oh, that's a cool throw. And they just, that's jujitsu now. You know what I mean? Where wrestling doesn't do that. Judo doesn't do that. They're like judo, wrestling, this and that. But like jujitsu will take credit for anyone. So they just keep stealing shit and adding, right? And, and I think that's, and I think that's great. You have to evolve, but I think we have to, really focus on like it's a good to evolve but don't just throw random shit in there like if it doesn't work for the majority then that shouldn't be jujitsu you know what i mean like picks the, you yeah fads fads are just fads they come and they go do you think right? that it, like, sorry do you think it should even be called jujitsu now like no gi at least or should it be more like you know submission grappling because it's kind of uh you know <sighs> gone pretty far from the source yeah i that's a tricky one and that just goes back to like the, uh, the belt color being the level of competition instead of the level of knowledge. That just reaffirms it. You know what I mean? We're like, well, okay, purple belt. How are you a purple belt division when you've never put on a belt? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that. So I think if you've, I'm not saying you got to train gi, but if you're going to call it jujitsu, you should be training the fundamentals and understand the history and, uh, and you should know your lineage and you should understand the heritage and like, you know what I mean? There's of jujitsu. So otherwise, yeah, what is it? Catch wrestling, submission wrestling. You know, I'm not really sure. I don't know. It's tricky because most of the best guys in the world, they are coming from jujitsu, like in a way still. But that's where it's got kind of weird where they've gotten, uh, yeah, they've really gotten away from that. Like these guys who, um, there's great coaches out there, Don Hu, uh, Don Hu and all these guys, but I'm like, they're they're going out and these guys never put on a gi before and whatever else but i'm like yeah but where'd you get you and he is a genius without a doubt right but i'm like but you were a jiu-jitsu guy with a gi on and a belt first like where did you lose that part you know what i mean like so these all i don't know i just think if you're gonna call it jiu-jitsu and you, you still gotta you should have some knowledge of your roots and that is where we're losing the culture of things is because it's a sport Right, a purple. You have a purple rash guard now instead of a purple belt. It's fucking weird to me. <laughs> uh, do you think that combat jujitsu is a phase that people are going through, or do you think it's important for people to learn uh, positions can get you fucked up if you're in the wrong spot? Fucking the dumbest thing in the world. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, and it just it's fucking stupid. You've seen that one. Uh, it went viral. The guy go. Uh, recently he's going for a hill hook and he gets the palm strike and goes to sleep like bad. You've seen it. I'm sure you have, but I'm like, that's the point. Like fight or don't fight. Don't tell me those combat jiu-jitsu guys studs for sure. But don't tell me you're, if you've never done them, if you're doing MMA and you're doing that just as a high side hustler, or if that's your thing or whatever else, but yeah, for sure. But it's not a real fight. Right. So again, you're, so now you're in combat jiu-jitsu, you jump on all these heel hooks to this and that. And then the answer is one punch in the face. Like, I think, I think it's the dumbest fucking thing in the world. You either do MMA or you don't like, I don't know. I don't fucking get it. Yeah, right? I agree. So my, you my might as well do all. that. Yeah, yeah. Like do those, just do those slapping contests instead if that's what you're going to do. Like, yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me. 
Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, I've actually, I tried it once just for fun. I asked like my buddy, if he wants to, let's just try it, see how it goes. And it's the most awkward thing, actually slapping someone while you're rolling. I don't want to do this anymore. So we did it for like one minute. It's like, screw this, you know, rather just put the MMA yeah. clothes on and like, you know, and do that just do MMA. And, uh, yeah, but yeah I think really- she just do it. Sorry. Yeah. I think jiu has gone so far from like, it used to be really synonymous with MMA. It's like, uh, yeah, most people were training towards MMA and now most people are training towards sport. And do you think it's going to keep growing the way it is? And you know, like how, how far do you see jujitsu going? Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, I, again, I do love the ever like evolving part of it. Um, but I think if we don't take it back to the roots, it's going to suffer like, even as a sport but who knows um people are like oh it'll be in the olympics one day no it won't ever the ibjgf would never let jiu-jitsu go to the olympics ever because they're, they're going to be out millions and millions and millions of dollars a year if you were going to make it because it, like an olympic sport olympic sports are like you don't pay to go to judo. You don't pay to go to wrestling. Jiu-Jitsu is like become monetized, which will never make it a great amateur sport. You know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> uh, and because the rule set's always changing and there's so much politics and this and that, like, it's just insane. Also what, uh, what, sorry, I just brought up the Olympics, but what's, what's messed everything up too is now they have world championships for like every belt division, yeah. right? Exactly. Fucking dumbest, dumbest thing in the world. Like I appreciate it. I'm like, man, travel, compete, like get the experience, go to cool places, meet great competition, whatever else. But like, <clears throat> you shouldn't be a world champion unless you're a black belt. In my yeah. personal opinion, like there's in judo, you don't go to worlds as a brown belt. Like you, and you also can't pay to go to worlds. The worlds are two every every two years. You have to win your state or your province and then you have to win your country and then you have to qualify in a whole bunch of international tournaments and then you'll be invited to go compete in the world ibjgf you got the money or funding or whatever else you just pay your whatever and you go enter how's that a world championship like there's a million kids in brazil that'll fucking smash you they just couldn't afford to be here right so i don't know i i, I can't even remember where we're going with that like i just the future of it it's I don't know. I, I hope, uh, I think it'll, it's going to keep evolving and keep growing. I just hope at some point it finds its way back to, uh, its origins and its roots a little more. And that's, I think that's the most important thing is like, don't forget that it's martial art because if we completely forget then the whole thing's fucked, like, you know what I mean? So yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think it'd be cool one day to see it as a high school sport because, you know, then it would be free, which kind of screws academy owners in a way, which, but, you know, just fine. Like, we got to spread your jiu as much as possible because I don't know, like, in Ontario at least, like, wrestling isn't super popular, but, like, because jiu is becoming so popular, it makes, to me at, at least, it makes sense to have jiu instead um, because there's so many people that train it already. Because I know, like, you know, I've had a couple students, they, uh, they, they started jujitsu, then they, now they're in high school and now they're doing wrestling. They're mm-hmm. like, wow, I already know these techniques. Like, you know, you already showed me them. And they're just like blown away. They have such a competitive advantage over the other kids. So, you know, yeah. it might be cool to see jujitsu instead, um, because it is growing so much more than wrestling, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, you can look at it the other way too. There's been a, a, a resurgence in wrestling as well, because, um, uh, because of jiu-jitsu and MMA. Like, if you look at a high high school wrestling team now compared to what it was 10 years ago, they are much larger. That oh, sport yeah. is growing and growing again, like huge. Uh, and is, again, I think it, I think it's hand-to-hand, which is grappling in general, you know what I mean? And, and now uh, kids who are doing jiu-jitsu or, do, or want to do MMA, now they, they're kinda, they have a better understanding that they can go through post-secondary doing wrestling, right? And still come out the other side with a degree and, and and fight MMA, you know what I mean? So like, there's still, uh, but who knows, who knows, like the Olympics tried to get rid of wrestling a couple of years ago. Oh yeah. And like, yeah. wrestling is the, uh, yeah. And wrestling is the oldest like sport on the planet. You know what I mean? It is when you think Olympics, you think, re- well, I personally, I'm like wrestling and running. Like that's as old as it gets. You I know believe I mean? wrestling like, was the, the first sport supposed to be. Yeah. I think mean, it was the first sport ever. First yeah. Olympic Olympics, sport. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's it's great. crazy, and they want it like we. 
So I don't know. I, 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 I would like to see it at a, I'd like to see it just more accessible, right? Of course, me and you, we got to make a living, right? So yeah, we got to have our GM and a teacher, but I like, there's, there's a lot of projects like S, uh, X guard. And there's also like, uh, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. After school programs would be cool or just a more community programs, something like that, where made people, it made it a little more accessible to people and a, a little more, <clears throat> and then we share, we share our knowledge. You know, you put your after school program, you put, you know, you, you put one of your purple belts there and teach a couple of days a week and to spread it through the community. And then, people aren't going to go there instead of your place. You know what I mean? They're going to, they're going to go there and learn and be like, I want more. And then they go to Jordan's place. You know what I mean? That's the kind of way I, I just think it'd be such a, it's such a positive thing to be able to expose kids to whether they live really small or they're in high school, or whatever else. So I think, um, especially inner city or rougher neighborhoods, if they had a GNC program and it would just change so much, right. But not everyone could afford that membership every month. Right. So, but yeah. that's, uh, that's something we're working on. I can, I'll let you know soon. Yeah, well, I think one thing about both me and you, we've never been about the money when it comes to jujitsu. Like, I know, I, like, uh, when I used to come to your gym, you would never charge me for a drop in, and I always like super appreciated that. And because it would cost me a lot of money to get there, because it was like an hour drive, so you know, gas money. Mm -hmm. And I've taken that same approach too. So like I've never charged a drop in ever at my gym and people always ask me like they want to, they want to support the gym and we get visitors all the time. But I'm like, no, like I want to return the favor, you know, and do what I think is right. But a lot of gyms, like, you know, like Atos in uh, California, I'm pretty sure they charge like $80 or something for a drop in, which is like ridiculous. And, uh, but some yeah. lot of gyms in general charge $20, 25, 30, whatever it is. Like what made you like decide not to charge, you know, the drop ins? Like what was your mentality? I I think, uh, I don't fault people. It's a business, right? They got to do what they got to do. It's when you're nickel and diamond people that, that bothers me. But like, uh, I think I've just been given so many opportunities in my life. And, uh, I think, and I'm really community minded. I'm like, I just wanted, someone invited me on the mats <clears throat> one day, just one day, didn't ask me for anything. And it changed my life forever. And not only mine, it's, I've changed, like my, I've had, thousands and thousands of students that have all and and there's so many great success stories you know what i mean i i think how can the only reason i charge <clears throat> for jujitsu is so that i can share more jujitsu you know what i mean if we don't keep our lights on a pair of bills how do we keep going with this we can't do we can't do it for free right i think but yeah as far as like i've never done it for the money of course we need the money but that wasn't my primary like motivation is just that I would have, I, you know, oh, you just saved my life. Like, like oh, I literally would, I would have been in dead or in jail or if I didn't find the martial arts path. And so, and I know I'm not that unique. So when people come in the door, you have to help them because you never know what anyone else is going off. You don't like, they don't know, you don't know how hard their life is. If they have any money, if they don't, maybe that $20 that you didn't charge them is what they can, it was their fucking food for the week. Like it's just me having one extra or two extra people drop by to train and hang out and have fun with. I don't need to make money off of that. And again, it all goes back to just the, uh, the, the chance I was given, you know what I mean? And I'd never, I never done anything, followed through on anything, been anywhere in my life until I started training. And now I've seen like, like I'm, I used to, I used to, yeah, man, like I, I say it all the time, but I used to, I've eaten out of a dumpster and I've flown first class around the world, man. And the difference between the two was me putting on a gi, you know what I mean? So uh, if you, if there's any chance that you can, you can create that same opportunity for someone else, like why wouldn't you? Right. Yeah. And you're maybe, maybe if I, I say, I didn't even think about not charging or this, that, but I'm like, maybe, yeah, you mean, maybe that's the, yeah, exactly. It's what put, help put you on a kind of a, a more a path that you're on as well. So that just goes to show that it was, it pays off, you know what I mean? So, man, 100% because, you know, I progressed significantly rolling with your guys because I didn't have a lot of higher belts to roll with. And, you know, you had a ton of higher belts to roll with. And yeah, back then I wouldn't be able to afford, you know, the a drop in and gas price. So 
I'm, mm-hmm. I have the same kind of mentality. Like I need to obviously make a living, but it's like, I don't need to make like that extra, like the nickel and dime at the expense of, you know, my members or like other people, other grapplers, people I could be doing good for. I think that's kind of where gym owners kind of like lose sight where it's like, they just want so much money and, you know, but it's like they're people that be paying them. A lot of them don't have a lot of money. So like you don't need to take that extra from them. So yeah, that's one thing really frustrates me about like uh, jujitsu gyms because there's a lot that are just like, yeah, they want your money bad and it's just frustrating. Paying for belts and yeah. such. Yeah. 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 Shit drives me nuts. I've never char- charged for a grading in my life, man. Like, that's not how it goes. You've been to my gradings, I think, before. Like, yeah. we all show up, smash each other for two hours, drink some beers, and go home. That's it. Right. Yeah. And I usually, uh, I will ask for a donation and I give I, it. So anything that comes in the door goes to charity the same day as I collect it. Right. So. I, I, yeah, I don't know, man. Like I make my money off of teaching lessons, right? I'm not selling belts or my soul or anything else. And again, it, it is, it's, I also personally believe that it should be car, part of the culture to pay it forward. You know what I mean? And create opportunity for, for some kid or some person, you know what I mean? Who would, this is going to keep them in school or maybe create a path where they can compete or travel or and see places they haven't been or, you know, maybe, again, maybe that drop in that drop in fee is between it's between them training GS that day or be, being able to eat for the next two days. Like you don't know, right? So what the fuck does it matter to us? Like you got, right? I'm not, yeah, I'm not going after someone for something like that. It just, I don't know. Like I'll, I'll but I, at the same time, I'll happily pay it if someone were to ask me if I went to someone's. If that's their policy, I'm like, yeah, sure, man, whatever. I'm not shitting on anyone for doing it. I just, for me, I've just seen it create a lot of opportunity for people by just not right so yeah i agree 100 because i just want to train with people like that's like i make a living for my students and i just want to train so if anyone's listening out there come come to the gym come train with us and with uh yeah. with that said um yeah it's been a great conversation justin thanks it's been about an hour now so we'll uh yeah we'll close it but yeah thank you so much for being the first guest uh, in our podcast thank you no no problem thank you very much and i just what while i'm here i, I just want to let you know how how uh how proud i am of you uh, your journey has been awesome to watch and, and uh, <clears throat> just to watch you turn into such a great black belt and teacher with, with a great school and so many loyal people and they, you, your entrepreneurial spirit, man, blows my mind. Every time I turn around, you got something going on. I'm like, good for you, man. Like I wish more people would just take the chance and go for it. Like, so I'm, I'm, I couldn't be happier for uh, one of my friends to have as much success as you have, man. So just keep that shit going. Well, I appreciate that so much, Justin. And you've been a big part of no my problem. journey. So I really appreciate everything you've done for me. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the kind words too. So thank you so much. My, my pleasure, boys. My pleasure. So uh, yeah, let's get together and, and uh, sometime soon we'll train and uh, hang out, whatever you guys want to do. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Sounds good.